During the Fallout series, we as players have been exposed to a long list of remarkable technologies. A few that come to mind are the Big Mountain Transportal Ponder and the Institute's Molecular Relay, which can teleport people in the blink of an eye from one place to another and the Garden of Eden Creation Kit, or GEC, which can transform, on demand, a barren plot of land into a veritable oasis. But something that is hardly ever seen in Fallout is time travel, and while it is incredibly rare to see, it does appear quite a few times throughout the series. In Fallout 1, during a special encounter, you may come across a British police call box, a mini police station of sorts that once served a multitude of purposes, such as allowing members of the public to contact the police. Inside, you could find a first aid kit, a fire extinguisher, and sometimes, an officer having his lunch. But as useful as these kiosks were, technology slowly improved, and they became more and more redundant. But unlike the others that were ultimately replaced by more advanced methods, this particular call box has stood the test of time. For this call box is the iconic time machine from the British science fiction television series Doctor Who commonly referred to as the TARDIS, an acronym standing for Time and Relative Dimension in Space, but it also means a building or container that is larger inside than it appears from outside, something that is often said by those entering the TARDIS for the very first time, something we are unable to do. The inside's bigger than the outside? Yeah. Much bigger on the inside. It's bigger on the inside. Is it? I noticed. <laughs> If approached, the light atop the TARDIS will begin to flash, a strange noise can be heard, and the entire thing will start flickering, in and out of existence before completely vanishing. Its new destination, unknown, unlike the destination of the next encounter. In Fallout 2, during another special encounter, you may come across a ruin of sorts, the remnants of a stone wall, a broken pillar, and an asymmetrical circular gateway known as the Guardian of Forever much like the one from the Star Trek episode The City on the Edge of Forever, in which the portal, named the Guardian of Forever, teleports some of the main characters through time. And that is exactly what it does in Fallout 2. The Guardian takes the Chosen One through time and drops them off at Vault 13 before the events of Fallout 1. There's not much to do here, but you can find the Solar Scorcher, a unique energy weapon that uses sunlight as ammunition, and you can also break the controller chip on the vault's water purification system, after which a notice reads, the vault has maybe 100 to 150 days left of water. This comforts you for some reason, and the reason for this comforting feeling is because of the broken water chip the events of Fallout 1 will happen which ends with the Vault Dweller being exiled by the Overseer, and without a home, he goes on to make a new one called Arroyo, and it is there the Chosen One is born. So by breaking the water chip, the Chosen One has secured their own existence, which is understandably a great comfort. But not all encounters involving time travel are as straightforward. In Fallout 76, you can find a location in the Cranberry Bog known as Pylon V13. V13 is a double reference, the first obviously being Vault 13, but the second is a little more obscure, which I will mention in just a moment. As for the structure itself, the repurposed section of the Appalachian monorail has recently been used by Professor Greebly, a scientist obsessed with achieving time travel. People told me my theories weren't possible. They mocked me and called me a foolish old man. Well. I'm here to tell you that the possibility of time travel is not only real, but that it can be accomplished interdimensionally. I've revolutionized this radical concept, a new way of thinking about skipping across timelines. Instead of employing the traditional and often clumsy use of gravity for time travel, I've discovered a way to punch a hole in the fabric of our reality. By slipping through this fissure in time and space at a high rate of speed, it's my belief that instantaneous time travel will occur. In a few weeks, I will be attempting to slipstream through dimensions using a monorail system as my chariot. If you wish to attend this historic event, I will be at Pylon V13 of the Appalachian monorail system. Be there and witness history. Some time has passed since Greebly attempted to travel through time using the monorail. However, the train is still here, so something must have gone wrong. On board, we find three dead scientists, a generator, the holotape you've just heard, another skeleton in plain clothes, 
and the button leading to his time machine. The time machine appears to be live as electricity can be seen escaping at random intervals, and pressing the button, which still works, causes the time machine to drastically increase its sputtering for several seconds before violently petering out. And that's it. So what happened? Well, Professor Greebly either designed a time machine, or he at least thought he had. We don't really know much about him. All we know is he was incredibly confident in his work and invited others to come and watch his latest and greatest achievement. I'm thinking the three dead scientists are the observers who have come to watch the experiment, and the skeleton in plain clothes is Professor Greebly. But something doesn't add up. For some reason, the scientists were on board when they died. If they were there to watch the experiment, they wouldn't be on the train, they would be on the ground where it was safe. The only reason I can think of for them being on board would be during a tour of the lab and a close-up of the time machine. But during a tour, everyone is together. Why is Professor Greebly away from the group, and why did he die beside the button? Well, he must have got an alert or heard a sound and told the others to stay put while he went to see what the problem was. And it was during this time where something went wrong. Now, it's important to note that the portal isn't connected to the generator, yet it's releasing electricity, and I think that's key to figuring out what happened. My guess is the portal does work, and originally it was opened using the generator. The many conductors and Tesla arcs surrounding the time machine shows that electricity was an integral part of the design, and Greebly must have thought it was safe or overlooked something in his flustered state, and a powerful surge of energy escaped the portal, which now seems to be powering itself. That energy was so powerful that it created a wire explosion, something that happens when a large current is forced suddenly through a small wire, which destroyed the connections before passing through to the train and electrocuting everyone on board. As to the second reference of V13, it's referencing Project V13, the codename given to the MMO Fallout online game that was ultimately scrapped, derailed if you will. Professor Greebly could also be another reference to Fallout Online, as one of the NPCs has the name Greebly, spelt with an E instead of a Y, but pronounced the same. After reading the Project V13 short stories, there seems to be some similarities between Professor Greebly and Greebly. Other than their names, they both have scientific backgrounds, and both are disliked. Professor Greebly was considered a foolish old man, his theories were mocked and considered derived, whereas Greebly was considered a know-it-all who was so full of crap, his name actually became synonymous with the word. I think Pylon V13 perfectly summarizes the troubles developers had with Fallout Online. Like time travel, it was an interesting idea, but an overall difficult concept to achieve, with many unforeseen complications resulting in the project being grounded. But sometimes a game isn't cancelled. Instead, the story is changed, and one such story that was never used is the original Fallout story that just so happens to include time travel. During the Game Developers Conference, Tim Kaine, the video game developer, described an alternate version of Fallout that is both ridiculous and brilliant. This alternate Fallout story would have started in the modern world and you would have travelled back in time before humans existed and killed the ape that would have evolved into modern man. With that done, you would have travelled back to the future, although now without humans, sentient dinosaurs, for whatever reason, took their place as the dominating species. At the sight of a human, the ruling dinosaurs didn't tear them to shreds, Instead, they exiled them to a fantasy planet that luckily had magic, and through using magic you could have returned to your original timeline, where humans were back on top, and dinosaurs were a thing of the past. As crazy as this story sounds, it really was something they considered, but the narrative was abandoned and the fallout we know and love was born. A world where time travel only exists in special encounters. However, I firmly believe it's only a matter of time before time travel makes a canonical appearance, perhaps as a futile journey to rewrite history and prevent the Great War. But Fallout is, after all, about learning to let go of the old world, of dealing with the consequences of our actions, and understanding that while our societies and cultures may change, humanity stays the same. And as the old adage goes, war, war never changes.
and I don't want time travel to try and change that. Be sure to show your support by liking the video and subscribing if you haven't already for more Fallout content. If there's anything you would like to see in a later video, leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. With that said, thank you as always for watching, and I'll see you in the next adventure.